Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are continuing our discussion of the endocrine system. This is lecture series two. We're going to talk about steroids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen, and this is video part one. We're going to start by talking about steroids, specifically corticosteroids, also known as glucocorticoids. These are steroids that are genu that gen generally uh, synthesized in your adrenal gland, in your adrenal cortex. They are anti-inflammatory hormones, and the receptors for these steroids are widely distributed throughout your body. Your adrenal gland secretes cortisol continuously, about 20 milligrams per day as a baseline secretion, but there are many things that occur during the day that will increase your secretion in response to stress and other uh, stimuli. Steroids, like cortisol, have anti-insulin effects. As you would expect in the stressed state, your body will be um, encouraged to put more glucose into the bloodstream. This is called gluconeogenesis. And it will inhibit glucose utilization, uh, leading to hyperglycemia. The vascular smooth muscle also has a response to catecholamines as a result of cortisol secretion. So in the stressed state, we expect blood pressure to go up, and that's mediated in part by cortisol facilitating the response to catecholamines. Corticosteroids also have a little bit of a sodium retention and potassium excretion effect. This is probably due to a mineralocorticoid effect, um, working on the aldosterone uh, receptor. Steroids can be used for a number of different indications uh, when they're given as a medication, as exogenous steroids. For example, we can give steroids to treat asthma, and some patients may take inhaled steroids, and as always, I've tried to give you some examples of uh, drug names you may encounter. So Asthmacort, Flovent, Beclovent, Pulmacort, Adver. These are all different formulations that contain a steroid. The nice thing about inhaled steroids is the effect is relatively local. You don't have a lot of systemic absorption, and so a lot of the systemic side effects that we will discuss shortly don't occur when you take inhaled steroids. Probably the biggest side effect is that you could get some deposition of steroid in your pharynx, which could lead to some dysphonia or even a, a yeast infection, a candidiasis, um, in the back of the throat or on the vocal cords. Now for asthma, we could give parental steroids. We can give them IV. Uh, this is typically done for a, a really severe acute exacerbation of asthma or COPD. Uh, people have described giving uh, cortisol or some equivalent amount of IV steroids before anesthesia, although I've never seen that done. Steroids can also be used as an anti-emetic. Most commonly we use dexamethasone 4 milligrams IV at the beginning of surgery. Some people want to give 6 or 8 milligrams IV, as we will see later, that's really a tremendous amount of steroid, and we probably want to do everything we can to minimize the amount of exogenous steroids we administer to our patients. Uh, but if you look in the data, there's not a lot of data to support giving more than 4 milligrams IV if all you're doing is trying to prevent uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting. The mechanism of dexamethasone as an antiemetic is unclear. It may have some role in surgery-induced inflammation or perhaps increase the release of endorphins, and it is as effective as some of the more uh, well-known anti-emetic drugs like ondansetron, which is Zofran or droperidol. Now in diabetics, we know that, like we said before, uh, blood sugar will go up, and perhaps our diabetic patients, uh, we don't want to make their blood sugar go up. And so we need to consider the risks of hyperglycemia versus the benefits. And the only thing I would point out is uh, there's recently more and more literature looking at this hyperglycemia and suggesting that maybe it's transient and doesn't have any real effect on long-term outcomes. So that would suggest that it's okay to give the dexamethasone even to, an anti even to a diabetic, knowing that it will transiently make their blood sugar increase. Dexamethasone is also used in the treatment of cerebral edema. This is typically a larger dose, 10 to 20 milligrams IV. And this is very effective for reducing intracranial pressure when it's elevated due to an ischemic injury or due to a trauma. We also use it in the neuroanesthesia setting because 
dexamethasone will decrease cerebral volume and allow the surgeons to retract brain tissue in order to get better exposure to the uh, structure they're trying to operate on. So we routinely give dexamethasone for intracranial surgery as well. Steroids are excellent anti-inflammatory drugs, and they've been used to treat a large um, assortment of different inflammatory conditions, including post-operative pain, lumbar disc disease, collagen diseases, arthritis, skin disorders, ulcerative colitis, and acute spinal cord injury. People have used steroids to treat post-intubation laryngeal edema, and especially in the case where prolonged or um, traumatic instrumentation of the airway occurs, people will give dexamethasone 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram IV, or typically somewhere in the 10 to 20 milligram IV range. There are many, many other indications for administration of exogenous steroids. <clears throat> steroids are immunosuppressive, and patients who receive organ transplants all often are given steroids uh, to suppress the immune system. Steroids have been used in the treatment of respiratory distress system, syndrome, in the treatment of leukemia and other certain uh, malignancies, and in the treatment of myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> the reason we mention all of this is so that you know every one of these patients who may have been given steroids due to their medical background should be asked if they are currently or have recently been taking steroids. And we'll see why that's going to be important in just a couple minutes. Your hypothalamus secretes a hormone called CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone. That hormone goes to the pituitary gland and stimulates it to release ACTH, acid, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And that hormone goes through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex and stimulates it to secrete cortisol. Cortisol then goes and gives negative feedback to these first two uh, stations uh, in order to suppress further secretion of cortisol. So this is called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal cortex axis. We know that patients who receive exogenous glucocorticoids will experience these corticoids having a negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So glucocorticoids administered exogenously will suppress cortisol releasing hormone and ACTH secretion. This leads to atrophy of the adrenal gland and impairs the ability of that gland to secrete cortisol in response to stress, which includes illness and surgery. This can lead to cardiovascular collapse, which would be an ad acute adrenal insufficiency or an Addisonian crisis in times of stress. Now the time course for recovery of the HPA axis after stopping glucocorticoid therapy is variable, and it really depends not only on the dose of the medication, but also the timing and how long the therapy was going on before it was stopped. This is certainly a very controversial area of uh, medicine, and there are a lot of different valid opinions out there about how HPA suppression should be managed. The most definitive approach would be to do an HPA axis evaluation. And while we don't see this being done very much uh, on the day of surgery, we do see this done in the intensive care unit. The easiest measurement would be to measure a morning serum cortisol, typically drawn before 8 a.m. A value above 10 mics per deciliter suggests an adequate HPA axis. Below 5 suggests an impaired axis. And between 5 and 10 suggests further testing is required or just giving an empiric stress dose if it is um, indicated. An ACTH stimulation test could also be done in which we measure the serum cortisol 30 minutes after giving a dose of ACTH. And a serum dose greater than 18 suggests that the HPA axis is adequate. <clears throat> now, as I said, this can be a controversial topic, and there's a lot of differences of opinions about which patients do and don't need stress dose steroids. This is one approach which I'm going to bring down for you in this lecture. And we can divide patients into three categories. The first are patients who almost certainly do not have a suppressed HPA axis. 
These would be patients who get a very low dose of steroid, let's say less than five milligrams a day of prednisone or the equivalent dose of a different steroid, once a day, and it's regardless of the length of time, whether it's for a day or a week or for 20 years. We know that every other day dosing has less of an impact on the adrenal gland, and so less than 10 milligrams per day every other day would also be considered non-suppressed. These guidelines also suggest that any dose of glucocorticoid given for less than three weeks, regardless of how high, should not be of sufficient duration to suppress the HPA axis. And having said all of that, if any of the above patients were treated with steroids any time in the past year, there should be no concern for HPA axis suppression. In that case, we should just continue the patient's normal daily dosing of whatever steroid they've been taking chronically, and no additional stress dose should be required, nor should we require any HPA axis evaluation. On the other end of the spectrum, we have patients for whom we highly suspect HPA axis suppression. These would be patients who take a large dose of steroid, that would be more than 20 milligrams a day of prednisone, and for more than three weeks. Also, any patient who takes glucocorticoids who has clinical Cushing syndrome, and these patients should be given stress dose steroids in the perioperative period in accordance with the magnitude of the stress, and we will discuss that in a few slides. Finally, we have the remaining patients who are what we would call intermediate. These are patients whose HPA suppression status is unknown. These are patients who take an intermediate dose of prednisone, 5 to 20 milligrams a day. Patients who take less than 5 milligrams a day, but they take it in the evening, which some people think may disrupt their normal diurnal variation. And any of the above patients, or any suppressed patient, who is treated with steroids any time in the past year. So this suggests that once patients are at risk for possibly having HPA suppression, that risk probably continues for up to one year, potentially. Ideally, these patients should get HPA axis evaluation with a serum cortisol level. However, that's not always feasible, and the guidelines suggest that in case of emergency or inability to test, a stress dose of steroids should be considered. Just one more note about steroid therapy, we've only talked so far about systemic therapy, but what about inhaled glucocorticoids or topical glucocorticoids or injections into the joint or the spinal space? These can potentially suppress the HPA axis at high enough doses, although for many years people thought that they had really just a local effect. And the truth is we don't see a lot of overt adrenal insufficiency in patients whose uh, source of exogenous steroid is from these kinds of routes of administration. We know that children may be at higher risk than adults, and some formulations may be higher risk than others. For example, inhaled fluticasone compared with other inhaled steroids, or certain high-potency topical corticosteroids. I'll leave it to you to look those up, but it doesn't include something like hydrocortisone. And these can cause significant HPA axis suppression, even with relatively low doses. And so we should probably evaluate the HPA axis in patients who get higher doses of fluticasone for more than three weeks within three months of surgery, or higher doses of other um, inhaled glucocorticoids for more than three weeks, and patients who receive uh, doses of high-potency topical steroids who get more than three glucocorticoid injections within three months, and again, any patient who appears cushing white or has symptoms or signs of adrenal insufficiency in the setting of exogenous glucocorticoids should probably be evaluated or else given empiric stress dose therapy. So when we talk about stress dose steroids, we have to pick a dose. And the dose is usually based on the magnitude of the surgical stress that we expect is going to occur. Understanding that surgical stress occurs not only in the operating room, but may persist for hours or days after the surgery. Most clinicians use hydrocortisone as their stress dose steroid. There are many other options, and we will discuss some of the other steroids in just a moment. But hydrocortisone seems to be preferred perhaps because other steroids bind to cortisol-binding globulin poorly, 
and there's more free physiologic active corticosteroid and more greater potency at any given dose. Uh, so hydrocortisone seems to be the most balanced of all of them for the purpose of stress dosing. And other steroids also vary as far as their anti-inflammatory and mineralocorticoid potency. And those are things to keep in mind as you realize there are different steroids preferred for different indications. Before we wrap up stress dose steroids, I wanted to show an example of perioperative stress dose steroid guidelines. Uh, these are just an example and other uh, regimens may exist. This table looks at a patient who is known to have a, a uh, suppressed HPA access and ascertains how much stress dose steroid they would need as a function of surgical stress. So for example, a minor surgery like a colonoscopy or an inguinal hernia may not actually need any hydrocortisone IV bolus. The patient can just take their normal usual morning dose and that would be sufficient. Whereas a major surgery like a cardiac surgery or a thoracic surgery would need a very large hydrocortisone bolus, 100 or even 150 milligrams, followed by a taper of 50 to 100 milligrams Q8 hours for three doses, and then tapering over the next couple days. And then most other surgeries fall in the moderate category, where a smaller bolus and a shorter taper would be indicated. Finally, we have this chart that compares different steroids and just determines what the equivalent dose of steroid would be. So if a patient takes 5 milligrams a day of prednisone, that would be equivalent to 20 milligrams a day of hydrocortisone, and so on for all of the different steroids. The uh, relative sodium retention power of the steroids is also shown in this table, where cortisol is the standard, and we see that most steroids are pretty close to hydrocortisone. Um, dexamethasone has basically no sodium retention, and fludrocortisone is really primarily a mineralocorticoid and has much, much more sodium retention effect. Finally, a few comments about the side effects of steroids. <clears throat> Many steroids have a mineralocorticoid effect, and you should think about aldosterone, which binds at the renal tubules, causes patients to save sodium and p-potassium, leading to edema, weight gain, and hypertension, and ultimately a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Patients who take steroids can also develop hyperglycemia, and many clinical signs including a buffalo hump, moon facies, abdominal striae, and tissue paper thin skin. Patients also develop osteoporosis, peptic ulcer disease, psychosis, depression, cataracts, and immunosuppression leading to increased risk of bacterial and fungal infection. That's it for this video. We will stop here and look forward to seeing you in class.